two weeks in the night on Father's Day, on Father's Day, on Sunday night service. And then we got a lot of uh, stragglers will be coming through here and there during the summer. And so I believe the Lord's got some good things for us in store here in the next few weeks. We just finished our spring program. It was good. And now we're going into the summer months, and they call it a summer slump. But it shouldn't be uh, in the work of the Lord. It shouldn't be a slump in your life. It should be a time when you can get closer to Him. I want to do something this morning that I hardly ever do. Hardly ever do. I believe a preacher ought to be prepared when he gets up to preach. And uh, that's a rule. However, it doesn't have to be that way. And so I'm going to preach this morning totally, totally unprepared uh, for what I'm going to preach on. It's just been on my heart all morning long. It was on my heart last night, and I didn't want to... I thought, well, my Lord, you know, I hadn't had time to prepare things, and I've been gone all day and getting home late all night, so... I'm not even, I'm not even going to uh, read Scripture this morning. I'm just going to quote you some and uh, preach this morning on the, the blessed thing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Buddy, I was thinking about that. The choir come out a while ago, and they begin to sing. And they begin to sing, The burden of sin has been lifted as far as the east is from west. You know, that's a long way this morning. The Bible talks about our sins being as far as east is from west. Have you ever tried to go east and get west? That's a long way, man. You'd have to go and go and go and go, and you never will get west. The only way you'd go east and get west is go around the world. Now, anyway, it's talking about when flat, dead east, you'll never get west. That's how far our sins are gone. Boy, I thought about this morning. I read a little bit of a message preached by Dr. R.G. Lee. And Dr. R.G. Lee said, you know how he talks, he's real eloquent, and he began to write in this book, and he said, uh, there, who uh, follow that scarlet thread through the Bible. And he talked about how that God, way back in the Garden of Eden, made a way for man's sins to be forgiven. You know, there's always had to be bloodshed in order to satisfy God. I like the song the Parker sang a while ago. He took me to Calvary and washed me white as snow. Didn't take me to church. He took me to Calvary. You can go to church and never be washed. You can get in the water and all you'll do is go down a dry center and come up a wet one and going to get the flu. But if he ever takes you to Calvary, your soul will get washed. I'm a firm believer this morning in the power of the blood of the Lamb. I believe there's power in the blood of the Lamb. I believe this morning the best way for you to get rid of your sins is to put your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, these days they're trying to talk people out of having guilt trips. And they're saying, now listen, we're going to psychoanalyze you. And you, you did, this didn't happen right when you was little. That didn't happen right when you was little. This didn't happen and that's why you feel guilty all the time. But I read in my Bible where it said that uh, the blood of Christ will purge our conscience. Our conscience, brother, our very conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I'm thankful this morning for the blood. I want to come out this morning, the blood. I'm speaking, as you know, I'm not reading the Scripture. I don't have an outline. I just want to talk in my mind this morning from my heart about the precious blood of the Lamb. It was a dark day for the world that day that Jesus walked up that hill after being beaten and scorned and mocked at and made fun of. They called him everything in the world. They put stripes on his back and the blood run out of his back. But he walked up that old hill with that old rugged cross on his shoulders. And, buddy, his shoulders were already cut open and bleeding. But the Son of God laid that old cross with splinters on it, on that back, and up that hill he went. Every step he took, brother, he's thinking of me and you. He was thinking of hopeless souls doomed for hell as he took those steps up that hill that, after that day. They got him up there and they put nails in his hand. Wow. They put nails in his feet. They put the cross on the heel. Have you ever stood up a, a basketball goal or a telephone pole? You know, you get your two or three people to help you lift, and you lift, and you lift, and it finally gets to that certain point where gravity gets a hold of that pole, and it just falls in that hole like that. 
I believe that's the way the cross, as they had the Lord nailed on it, his body weighed, of course, over a, a hundred pounds, I suppose, and they put him on that cross, they lifted, they lifted, they lifted, when that cross got to a certain place, bam! There it hit the ground. And you can imagine the pain that he felt there in his hands and his feet as that cross fell to the ground with a thud. Thou drip the precious blood of the Lamb down the cross for my sins and your sins. That's what made John the Baptist cry when he saw him coming across Gal uh, the shore there. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what made it good. You see, back in the Old Testament when people sinned, God had demanded that blood be shed for their sin. As a matter of fact, the first sin committed was by Adam and Eve. After Lucifer, of course, Adam and Eve were the first human beings to commit sin. And as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible tells us that God killed and had an animal killed, took the animal skin, and covered up Adam and Eve's nakedness. In other words, blood had to be shed. Blood had to be shed. But we'll notice throughout the Old Testament, excuse me, I'm reading in the New Testament, that the Bible teaches that it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could what? Take away sin. If a man had sin in his life, if a man committed sin, they, they killed the blood of bulls and killed bulls and goats and let their blood be shed. But those bulls and goats' blood could never take away those sins. The first thing you'll notice this morning is that the blood that takes away sin must be the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I like to think about those Old Testament people there when they'd go down there every day and they'd take that lamb there and slice that thing. That blood would pour out of that lamb's neck. They'd put it in there and the priest would take it in there and God would look down and he said, Okay, I'm satisfied. And God took the blood of those bulls and goats and he covered their sins. Notice the word that I used. I used the word covered. He simply covered their sin. Like uh, how many fingers I got up, right? Two. All right, now what I've done there, I covered. They're still back there, see? I just covered them. Now what God done with the blood of bulls and goats was he took that blood and covered those sins. And he kept them covered there until Jesus came and died on the cross. Now when Christ died on the cross, brother, those sins weren't just covered, they were taken away. Uh, like yeah, they were taken away and gone and thrown as far as the east is from the west. So what the Old Testament people did was they put their sin behind the blood of bulls and goats to temporarily keep the wrath of God off of them and keep them safe until they could get saved. Amen? They were safe until they were saved. And brother, when the Lord shed His blood on the cross, that's what made John the Baptist said, There he is. There's my cousin. There's the one that takes them away. First John said in the book of First John, He was manifested to what? Take away. Take away. What does Hebrews say? It was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should what? Take away. Take away. All they could do was cover them. But thank God the blood of Jesus could take them away. You know, I was thinking about asking forgiveness. And I thought about all the times we sin against God. And we think about, we do this, we say, God, forgive me. Then we do it again, we say, God, forgive me. Then you commit a sin, and you say, God, forgive me. And finally, the devil get on your case, and he'll say, God is tired of fooling with you. God will only forgive you so many times. And I'll guarantee you there's people sitting in here this morning that is living under a load of guilt because the devil has convinced you that God ain't going to fool with you no more, and he's tired of forgiving you. But the next time the devil comes and tells you that, you just read in your Bible and say, Devil, I never remember anywhere where the blood ever lost its power. Amen? I never remember reading where God said the blood of Jesus would have a limit to how many times He'd forgive you. I'm telling you this morning, there's power in the blood of the Lamb. It's not popular these days. What would you do if you was the devil? If I was the devil, 
Some people think I am. If I was a devil, and I knew that the only way anybody could get to heaven is through the blood of the Lamb, I'd do everything in my power to mock and discredit and minimize the importance of the blood, wouldn't you? I'd go in them song books, buddy, and I'd take them old bloody songs out. I'd get in that Bible and I'd want to get rid of the blood. I would never want a preacher to preach on the blood because it might offend some dignified guests in the audience. Now, we may have some dignified guests in our audience. I doubt it. But we may have. We may have some dignified guests here this morning. And, but I want to tell you something, Mr. Dignified Guest. You may think I'm an old spitting, slobbering, dumb hillbilly that know what he's doing. You're right on part of that. But you may, you may, I'm just, uh, I, I'm just, uh, I'm a hillbilly, dumb, spitting, slobbering that do know what I'm doing. And I'm telling you this morning, Mr. Dignified, I'm telling you, if you ever, you hear me, if you ever, I don't care if you don't like it, I don't care if you don't agree with it, if you ever step your foot inside the pearly gates of glory, it will be because you trusted the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Plus, nothing, brother, nothing else is going to get you to heaven. you die. You say, well, I'm on drugs, and I believe if I quit taking drugs, God, uh, I'm telling you this morning, it takes faith in the blood of Jesus Christ to get a man to heaven. God can do more with the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and all of our rehabilitation programs, than all of our training, than all of our rehab places. Now, I'm not knocking them at the moment, but I'm telling you this morning, brother, it takes the blood to cleanse your heart and your soul and from sin. You look at that word justified. You know what the Bible said we are through the blood of Jesus? We're justified. Now let me explain that word. If Donnie came over to my house, he said, I don't like what the preacher said yesterday, and grabbed a big rock and thrown it through the front window of my house. I'd run out there and I'd say, Donnie, what'd you do that for? He said, cause I'm mad at you, that's why. I said, well, now I'm mad at you. He busted the window out in front of my house. And we'd try to settle it some way or another. And then let's say Donnie took off in his car and sped down the road, and then the next day he'd come back. He said, Brother Danny, I shouldn't have done that. I don't know what come over me. I just didn't like something you said Sunday morning. You, I just don't like you anyway. There's just something about preachers I just don't like anyway. Always trying to sound holier than there and cram your religion on everybody's throat. They say, I don't like you. And so I come over here and busted your window out. But he said, I want you to know something. I'm sorry. And please, I'll do anything I can to make it right with you. Will you please forgive me? Now, if I'm the man I'm supposed to be, of course, I'll look back and I'll say, okay, forget about it. Don't worry about it. We'll get it fixed. I forgive you. No problem. Shake hands. Now, you know what he is? He's forgiven, but he ain't justified. I can forgive him, but I can't make him just. He's still guilty, right? He's guilty of breaking my window. What if I say, well, I don't, I don't want you to pay for it. I don't want you to fix it. Just forget it. He's still guilty, right? Now, let me show you the difference. When you come and ask God to forgive you, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm sorry for my sins. When He forgives you, He justifies you. You know what justify means? It means to clear the guilty. That means God looks at you just like you'd never done it. And that's what the word justified means. Just if I'd never done it to start with. It's justified never sin, man. It's just, now it's hard for me to believe and hard for you to believe, but when God looks at us, it's just like you never done that thing that you're coming. That's what the blood of Jesus can do. The blood of Jesus don't just cover up your sin. It washes it off. It washes it away. It disintegrates sin. It's like a vacuum cleaner. 
Every time you and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, as we walk in the light, He's in the light. He puts that vacuum cleaner on you and sucks them sins off fast. You can commit them, brother. And just takes them things and washes them and scrubs them and disintegrates them. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. Hallelujah. They're gone. Thank God this morning they're gone. I told you that story about that young man who was out in front of the, uh, I think it was in front of the palace in England. And he was over there and all the guards walking back and forth in front of the palace. Big little rich kid sitting in the back of a limousine. And he looked out and he said, Mama, I thought them guards wore white uniforms when they guarded the palace. And she said, Son, they do. They've got them on today. He said, No, Mama, they've changed. They're wearing red today. I'm sorry, they're wearing white today. She, he said, I thought they wore red. She said, That's right. They said they're wearing white today. Y'all know what color they're wearing? They're wearing red. <laughs> you got that? You could have saved me all that if you'd have listened the first time, and I'd have said it right. They're wearing red uniforms. He said, Mama, they got on white today. She said, No, they ain't. They got on red. He said, No, they're white. She said, No, son, they got on red just like they always. And what she didn't realize, that little kid was sitting in the back of that little thing, and it had red tinted windows in it. And it said, When you look at something that's red through a red tinted glass, it looks white. And boy, he said, I saw that, and he looked around and thought they had white uniforms on. And I heard that, and I about took a shouting spell. And I thought, glory to God, hallelujah, that's the way the Lord does. He sees me through the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy and not as I am. I tell you, I like those songs that talk about it like that. When God looks at me, see, when you see me, you see what's wrong with me. But when God sees me, He sees me as white as snow, unworthy, but washed. In the blood of the Lamb. Thank God this morning for the blood. We could shout all day about the blood. I heard about this old lady who was in a tent meeting. And this old liberal, modernistic, unbelieving, infidel preacher was up a preaching and ranting and raving about more, saying more and more about less and less. And he kept talking about uh, this and that, you know, and, and this problem and that problem and prophecy and outer space and God knows what. And he began to talk about the mud. And he said, used to, people used to think that there was power in some kind of special power in the blood of the Lamb. And used to, the old timers used to think that the blood of Jesus done something. But he said, Jesus was a fine example for us to follow. But his blood was no different from anybody else's. It was just blood. That has nothing to do with sin and God. It was just blood. And boy, it kind of got quiet over that big crowd. Even that crowd wouldn't take that kind of preaching. And about that time an old lady stood up, that old lady stood up about halfway back in the congregation. And she stood up and said, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And that guy looked at her, and boy, about the song, the second verse, she began to say, The dying thief. And some people started joining in with her. And they all started singing, That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. But if that old boy on the cross back there couldn't go back and straighten out his life, he couldn't go join the church. He couldn't be tithes. He couldn't get baptized. That guy didn't have no hope. He said, I'm going to hell. But he rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And thou may I, though thou as he, wash all my sins away. Buddy, I got a lot of them to wash away this morning. But I thank God I'm vile like he is. But my sins have been washed away in the blood of the Lamb today. Boy, by the time I get to that song, then in a nobler, sweeter song, I sing that power to say, when this poor lisping, stammering tongue falls silent in the grave. And one of these days when we die, listen, you know what the past word to get in heaven is? The blood. If I died this morning and I stood before the pearly gates, I mean, it don't work like this, but let's just say I stood before the gates and God met me at the gates and said, Danny Castle, what are you doing here? I say, Lord, let me in. And the Lord looked back and say, Why should I let you in? And he'd start saying, What's up? And I'd start thinking of my life. You think I'd say, Well, I'm a preacher. 
Look how short my hair is. See my ears. See this? That's a King James Bible. Is that big enough? Buddy, I wouldn't even think of such stuff. Lord, I preached every Sunday. God, I've been in church for 17 years. God, I've done the best I could. You think I'd say that? If the Lord looked at me and he said, why should I let you in here? Buddy, you know good and well what I'd say. I'd say, Lord, remember the blood. And the Lord would swing the gate and say, come in, son. That's a pious word there. That's a pious word. You know, I'd love for the Lord just to come down here and do something amazing this morning. I don't know if this got much to do I'm preaching, but I can't keep from thinking about it. God can do more. I've learned from preaching that God can do more but just me saying these few thoughts on the blood, obeying Him. And He could have, if I'd have had another sermon that he didn't want this morning. Somebody here needs to come to Calvary. There's somebody here this morning carrying such a heavy load. you feeling guilty all the time. You can't find no peace. You can't find no satisfaction. You can't find no joy. There's something missing in your life. You're a miserable person. You hate everybody and everything. I'll tell you what you need. You need to come to the Lord this morning and ask him to wash you in the blood of the Lamb. You know, it ain't rained hardly none in, in a couple of weeks. Just come, come a little, We got a little shower yesterday evening. and I, I spent a lot of time in March, or I had Brother Brady come up and we planted my yard. And for the first time in, since I believe there, I wanted some grass. You know, a good, I wanted my grass to look good. Worked on my house last summer, worked on my yard this summer. And I said, I want my grass to come up pretty and we worked and worked and disc and hard and whatever you do to it and fertilized and the grass. Man, it was beautiful about a month ago. And I noticed my grass was turning green, uh, turning brown. It turned brown spots in it. And I said, my soul, my grass is a dying. We spent all this time working on it. So I had to go down to Walmart Friday night and I went to get some stuff for the camp and some supplies and stuff that we was going to need and I bought me a little old sprinkler. One of them little kinds got these little yellow things sticking out of it and you turn your hose into it, turn the water on and it starts going around like it's just slinging water out all every direction. I said, I'm going to buy me one of them little things. It's about seven or eight dollars. I said, I want to water my grass before it dies. I ain't going to spend all that money on my grass then watch it die. So I got home Friday night. I hooked it up and tried it out out there in the yard and I was out there fooling with that thing and put it on there and turned the water on and here it went and it was covering an area about as big as from me to brother John there I guess in that uh, circle and I let it run there for about 10 minutes and I, you ever tried to move one of them things when it's running <laughs> you don't do that I was trying to get under it like this I was getting under it like that it'll squirt you all over man and it had little wheels on it where you can drag it around. And I turned the water off and moved it and went in the house, stayed a little while. It was real late. I got about as far as from here to the wall over yonder my yard wet, I reckon. I doubt if I got that much. And my run out of run well dry. I knew I was going to do that if I didn't turn it down. You know, I'd, so I turned the pump off, turned the, turned the water heater off. And so it would drip, drip, drip back in there and fill up. I said, I'll just turn it off tonight and we'll turn it back on in the morning. And I didn't think nothing about that until yesterday evening. And I was getting ready to take a shower and head out to Bryson City yesterday evening where I had to preach last night. And son, the sky got black. And it come a big thunk cloud. And buddy, I mean, I don't know if it done it where you live. But we've been paying our tithes down Nebo. <laughs> Buddy, I mean, God opened up the windows of heaven there for about 15 minutes. I thought it was good. My soul! The wind! And it just... 
And I looked out there and there was water all over the porch. There was water all over the driveway, running down the driveway. There was water on the car. There was water on the truck. There was water in the backyard. There was water in the front yard. It was running off the sides of the house. The drains were overflowing. It was running down on the sides of the house, down the windows. Everything was soaked. And I looked out there and I saw the big stream of water running down the driveway. And boy, all of a sudden it hit me. And I thought, here's my little man-made method over here uh, trying to water my yard. It was tink, 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 spring, spring, spring. It went out there and didn't even want to get the ground wet. It was dry 15 minutes after my well went dry. And, buddy, when I said, when God takes an ocean to water it, brother, he can water it. I mean, God dumped the water out all. I said, thank God, that's the way you water a lawn, man. I mean, that'll put that little thing I got at Walmart out of business. And I thought about that. We try so many little man-made methods, and we try so many of our little tricks. Find the religion. Find this. Why don't you let God dump the real thing on you this morning? Better God could pour out a shower of blessing on you this morning that you could never work up of your own. You can you pump your well dry trying to find peace and happiness. But God's got an endless, boundless supply of the blood of the Lamb that will take sins away this morning and water the garden of your life. Make it bloom once again. There's power in the blood of the Lamb. Let's stand and bow our heads.